welcome to Flourishment, the podcast on living life as you were meant to, so you can flourish. Welcome, everyone. I have an amazing guest with me today. Her name is Kirsten Panachita. And she writes and speaks to infuse courage into the soul weary. She's the author of Among Lions, Fighting for Faith and Finding Your Rest While Parenting a Child with Mental Illness. And she's here to talk to us today about soul rest while parenting in crisis. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you. I am very pleased to be here. Tell us what makes you feel like you have to talk about this message. I know this is very personal for you. Can you share with listeners where this comes from in your life and in your heart? Well, I belong to one of those clubs that no one ever signs up for on purpose. I have a son who has bipolar disorder and he was diagnosed when he was 14 with major depressive disorder. It was only later that his proper diagnosis was found. The first three years, especially of his illness, when he was 14 to about 17, we really just went from crisis to crisis to crisis. And it was so difficult not only to navigate that for him as his caregiver, but also for us as parents, my husband and me, I was desperate to know that there was hope in this situation. I wanted to know that my faith could survive this very devastating time period for us. I wanted to know that my soul could come out with wholeness after all of that. And when those crisis years ended and God started to bring well, stability to my son, Nicholas, but also healing to me. I thought back on that and I thought, oh, there, you know, this little club that I've joined, I've met so many of these parents now, and we are all have those same questions. And I want to be able to reach back to someone who's not quite as far along on the path and tell them that, yes, there is help and hope for your soul as you go through this grief and pain with your parenting process. Mm, So important. So for you as a parent, Kirsten, what made you reach out at first to find this community of people that you so desperately needed? Well, when Nicholas first got sick, it really hit us out of the blue. I know for some parents, they have sort of an inkling earlier on for their children that they are going to need help. But for Nicholas, it was like it fell out of the sky and squashed our lives. (laughs) And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to get help for himself. And I was so shocked And I felt so ambushed by this circumstance that had crashed into our life that I, I started looking and I, I had heard through the grapevine sort of, of a couple other families whose child had mental health struggles. And so I called them and at first I just sort of cried. And, but those questions that I asked were, are we going to be okay? Is there any way to, to be okay in this situation? And because that was really what I needed to know. I, I didn't need to know right then if my son was going to be healed. I didn't need to know right then what the whole journey was going to look like. I just needed to know that someday I was going to be able to breathe again. And How did you find them other than just stumbling across them? Is that just an happenstance that brought you to the friends that you needed most for support? Well, that is, you know, that's a great question because for me, I do feel like I'm not going to call it luck. I believe that God put those people in my life, but there wasn't a great systematic way of finding that support for at least not for me right at first. 
now I know that there are support groups there, you know, there's a great support group called Hope for Hurting Parents. There is National Alliance for Mental Illness that has chapters all over the country, Fresh Hope for Mental Health. Those are all great resources, but I didn't know about many of those at the time. And I think that that is true of a lot of parents. And that's another reason why I'm passionate about this, because there's still this stigma about mental illness in a family. And unfortunately, especially in the church, that people don't talk about that. You know, it doesn't end up on the church prayer list. It doesn't necessarily get prayed for during the morning announcement time on a Sunday at a Sunday service. So we don't know until we become open about it ourselves. I discovered that there were a dozen families in my little church that had struggled with this, but I only discovered it after our family had been open about it in our church community. And then they all sort of came to me, you know, and a lot of times it's the, it's the loved one themselves who, you know, feels very private, doesn't want it shared. And so the parents obviously need to respect that. And who are they going to share their pain with if their child doesn't want them to talk about it, that it's, it's a very lonely, painful place to be. So some of what our family is committed to is just being open in order to battle that stigma. And I have to give a lot of credit to my son, because he has always from day one, been very open himself with his friends and other people. He has always told me that I could tell his story, and not even leave out any bits. That's always been an open book for him. And I do think that that's important to say on this podcast so that people don't think that I'm, I'm disrespecting his privacy. He's, he wants to battle this stigma as well. For those who are in the early stages of a parenting crisis like this, would you say that's a first step is to reach out to NAMI or Hope for Hurting Parents or an organization where they can get support from other families that are going through the similar crises or have already been further along in those crises? I would say that that should be one of the first steps. You know, obviously the the very first step is to get to your doctor and right, find right. find treatment for your child. But yes, because you're going to need a crash course in education for one thing and the support of the community of people who understand and have been there and who will sort of hold your your tender heart while it's aching during those first days is crucial to feeling like you are not alone god has not abandoned you your family is is going to be able to navigate this because there are other people who are going to come alongside. And in those organizations, you can find some different kinds of answers and different perspectives than you would receive from professional counselors. I think that's true. Yes, that is true. I mean, professional counselors are a key ingredient of a treatment plan to both for your child and for yourself. You know, my, I went to a therapist for a while. My husband and I did marriage counseling for a while. I, you know, I have, I believe in good counseling, good therapy, but those peer support groups are really important because sometimes you cannot say the things that you need to say out loud anywhere else. You can't say them necessarily to your spouse because they are having their own grief and anger and, and so forth. You can't necessarily say them to in the presence of your child because you're trying to be very careful about that. But to another mom who's been there, you can talk about how angry you are. You can talk about how, how resentful toward the circumstance you feel. You can talk about how bone weary you have become in, in trying to manage the caregiving and they will understand and most likely will not judge you for that because they've been there themselves. I believe there's probably an element of hope there too. That's different because someone else who has survived for X number of years in this situation can tell you, we are still surviving. And there's a different perspective that you get from that than what you would get from a professional counselor. That's true. That is true. It's incredibly 
hopeful to be able to see someone whose faith is still thriving, um, probably deepened because of what they went through with their child. Um, when you are questioning your own ability to hold on to your faith and you look ahead and you see that person, you realize, oh, it's not only possible, but God held them together. I don't need to hold myself together. That's almost always the response that you get when you say, how did you get through this? Oh, God got me through it. You don't have to hold yourself together. God can do this. And it, it strengthens you. It helps you to trust that their God is your God too. For those out there who are going through parenting crisis, do you have some specific tips that really helped you when you were struggling? Yes. I would say that it was a combination of things, but one thing that helped me, and this might just be my personality type, so everyone needs to discover this for themselves. It helped me to have a sense of preparedness. I did things like making sure I had a bag packed in case I needed to bring my son to the hospital so that if that day came or when that day came, as it did several times, I wouldn't have to also have that on my mind. I could just concentrate on the situation at hand. I kept a log of every medication and every appointment and those kinds of things so that I never had to take up brain space with trying to remember those things. I'm not naturally organized in my head, so I need to have external organization tools and those things help. In terms of making sure that I was strong enough, fueled enough, to be able to go do the next thing each day. I had to get enough sleep. That was really key. And my husband and I sat down one day and said, how are we going to work this out so that we both make sure we get enough rest? And that was really important for me. Exercise, making sure I got out in the fresh air, even if it was only for a half hour for a walk. And a lot of times that was when I could cry because nobody was around. I, I wasn't going to distress my son with my own tears. And I, I would walk around my neighborhood <laughs> kind of weeping some days. But it was such a, a good relief for all the, that stress that builds up in your body. Because that stress can really cause physical symptoms, illness. It did for me. And, um, and I really needed to deal with that. And just an awareness of the fact that when you are parenting a child who is in crisis, you yourself are also going through a crisis. You are experiencing a trauma because someone that you love so much is in so much pain and you are witnessing that. And there's research done on this that parents can develop, it's called acute traumatic syndrome from, for example, witnessing their child's self-harm, especially from uh, being near to someone who has suicide attempts. Those things can, and if not treated, acute stress disorder can turn into post-traumatic stress disorder and then become quite a problem for your own mental health. So an awareness that, that you are going through something it can't just be about your kid because your own mental health needs to be strong. It needs to be cared for. If you need therapy, if you are sinking into a depression, you need to have that evaluated by a professional and to just take care of yourself and recognize that this is huge. This is something that you are going through that is traumatic. Mm, it's a lot to take in, but it rhymes because it's prepare, be attuned to self-care and be self-aware. So That's all of those tips kind of fall in line, don't they? Yeah. And it's hard for people to remember to get prepared. It's hard for people to remember to take care of themselves because there's a sense of guilt sometimes for a caregiver to focus on themselves. They feel right. like they need to put all their energy into their child, but right. why can you share why that's important to take care of yourself? Well, and I, I do want to acknowledge that taking care of yourself takes time too. It's not just a question of you feel like your attention should be going toward your loved one who is ill, but 
sometimes you are just so busy just trying to get through life and you add in appointments or um, trips to the hospital or whatever it is that is adding extra things to your already busy schedule. The idea of taking time to do something to take care of yourself just seems impossible. And I, I do want to acknowledge that because you know, I, I remember reading lists of things you could do for self-care and saying, okay, well, when exactly am I supposed to fit that in? I don't have time to, to do any of those things. But I will say that anything you can do, any help that you can latch onto that will help you take the time for yourself that you need to deal with your own stress is so valuable in the way you're going to be able to take care of your child. You cannot think clearly when you are sleep deprived. You can't be at full strength to do the things that you need to do. You can't respond in a loving and measured way to your child's crisis if you were on an emotional edge yourself. And that's important for their treatment. You know, I remember when Nicholas would you know, he would be going through a very bad patch and say he came to me and he had self-harmed and I needed to be almost clinical in that. I needed to be very calm, very neutral. You know, I couldn't react, but of course what I wanted to do was cry and ask him what had happened and how could he feel like this? You know, all those emotions are there, but that's not helpful for him. So I need to, to make sure that I was not at the edge of my emotions, that I could control my emotions. And if you're sleep deprived and your stress has built up and you haven't been taking care of yourself, it's just so hard to be the person that your child needs you to be in those situations. And like you said, with making lists, you're going to have people who want to help you. So if you can list some of the things that could possibly be delegated to other people that will allow you to use some of that extra time you would get to do those self-care things that only you can do for yourself. Only you can sleep. No one else can do that for you. Only you can exercise. Only you can take time to clear your mind and go for a walk and pray and, and discharge all of that sorrow and grief emotion and stress emotion that you need to get out outside of your house. You can ask other people to help clean, to help do errands for you and some of the time consuming things that you don't personally have to do. That's a really good point. It's true that people, people do want to help and they don't know how, and they will respond. Your friends who love you will respond to your plea for help. They will probably be grateful that there's something practical that they can offer you during that time. Now, that's a really, a really good point. I would, I would recommend that people even make a list of those people. Who could I call, you know, and ask them for, for some help? You may not at first know what to tell them, but if you keep a constant list of some of those things that can be delegated, some of those little minor things that aren't requiring personal attention, then you'll have that to answer them with when they say, what can I do? How can I help you? Right. And yeah, so I think that would be very, very helpful for people who are not knowing what to do or how to answer people who want to help. And I think what you said about giving other people the opportunity to be a blessing blesses them is really important to underscore here. We can easily be tempted to believe that we're becoming a burden on our community, which is not the case. That's true. That's a lie that sometimes people tell themselves. Believing that we should be able to do it all on our own, it keeps us from receiving the help that other people would love to give us. And it keeps us from being in a community and being connected with other people because we have that, you know, need to go it on my own kind of mindset, which is, you know, it's not spiritually or emotionally healthy. And it certainly isn't going to help you in your all important task of caring for your child. And it helps the people in the community to develop empathy and understanding for all those who are going through parenting crises. 
I think that's true. And, you know, that's another way that we can sort of bring this out into the open. The statistics are that one in five people in their lifetime will be diagnosed with a, a mental health struggle. And that's, you know, if you don't are, are not that person yourself, chances are, you know that person, you're a neighbor with that person, that person sits down the row from you on Sunday morning in church. And it's all around us. We need to be able to support each other. Given that statistic, what would you say to those who are struggling and feel as though they're isolated and all alone in their struggle? Well, that can be very difficult. Um, as I referenced before, sometimes the, the loved one, the, the child does not want you to talk about it to other people. They feel ashamed. They don't want to be different. And it's, it's very important that we respect that because it's not our illness. We need to respect their wishes. I would say in that situation, ask your child, what would you be comfortable with me sharing? Can I just say that our family is going through a hard time? Can I say that that you are going through a hard time without specifying it? Can I tell just these two people, maybe, who, who I know will be a support to me? Try to negotiate that with your child and just say, you know, I, I don't want to spill all your secrets. That's not my goal at all. I just want to have some people who will pray for me and support me. I will talk about my own emotions. I will talk about my own circumstance and I will, I will keep your things private as you wish me to. But try to have that conversation with your child because that isolation is just toxic. And maybe they're seeing that you are not ashamed of what they're going through, that you don't think it's something that needs to be swept under the rug or hidden in a closet maybe that will help them to realize that this is not something that I need to hide. This is not something that is my fault or that I need to be ashamed about. And so you can model that as you, as you have that conversation with your child. That's great advice. And what are some other things that you might recommend for those who are going through a parenting crisis? Well, the first thing that the very, very first thing that I would recommend is to lean into your relationship with God. This can be really fraught because when something so devastating comes into your life, it can really shake your belief system. It can make you question what you think you know about God. But I would say lean into that. Bring all of that emotion and questioning to God. He would so much rather that we sit in his lap and pound on his chest with our fists than that we stand far away from him and shake our fist. He, he may not give us the answers, but I can tell you from personal experience that he holds me. He held me together. I got to a point where I was so shaken and devastated that my only, my only deep belief that I stood on was if I belong to Christ, then he is the one holding me that I don't need to worry about all these questions and all these emotions. And, you know, and and I don't need to worry about my soul because he is holding me. And I will tell you that that bedrock was firm for me. So I would say, lean into that, pray, tell him, tell, tell God what you're feeling and why you're angry and why you hate this and wish this wasn't happening and you can't see a purpose, but tell him all the awful things that, that you want to be honest with him about and, and lean into him, read your Bible, let the scripture speak to you, let his Holy Spirit speak to you, um, let his people come and minister to you. I have found that he can be trusted with my heart. I love that you're talking about that ugly cry in front of Father God. He already knows all of those deep, dark emotions that we're feeling. Some people feel as though they have to clean up their prayers before they pour them out into God. And if you, if you read the Psalms, you know that David, who I believe was bipolar, 
toward every emotion, no matter how deep in sorrow and depression he was, or how high on the heights of manic expression he was, he poured everything out before God. I'm so yeah. grateful that the Psalms are in our scriptures because it's such a good model for us about how we do not have to hold back on those, you know, ugly out there emotions. And that's what made David a man after God's own heart, not because David was perfect because he wasn't, but because he poured everything out from his heart into God's own heart. Yes. What are some specific resources that you could recommend books or online communities or Facebook pages that might be helpful for those who are parenting in crisis? Um, yes, I have found great support in online communities. There are a couple Facebook groups that I am a part of. You do have to be careful a little bit because um, some of these groups have thousands of people with very varied experiences and worldviews, but just being able to see a post and say, oh, it's not just, it's not just us, someone else is going through, that is helpful. Uh, I would say that the most helpful Facebook group that I am a part of is the Hope for Hurting Parents Facebook group. And I would also recommend the book that Dina Yoy wrote that is called You Are Not Alone. Um, D Dina and her husband, Tom, are the founders of Hope for Hurting Parents, and they have great resources, and they also have uh, online support groups that you can go to. I believe they are weekly, and those are terrific. They are just very good leaders. They have good resources for those support groups, and their, her book, You Are Not Alone, is that was probably the first book that I read way back when, when I was first starting to go through this with my, with my son that I read and I was like, oh, thank God, you know, someone has, has had this experience and has some wisdom for me. Um, I will say their group is also very good for parents who have prodigals or who have children who are struggling with substance abuse. Um, and not just mental illness. They're a little bit broader with their ministry. I am part of the NAMI FaithNet online community. This is a group of people who want to bring their experience either as a person with mental illness or as a loved one into the context of their faith. Um, so it's an interfaith group, but that is a very inspiring and hopeful and supportive online group. I went to the NAMI family to family training uh, midway through uh, those crisis years with Nicholas. That was less of a support group, although there was, there was some of that where we got to share with each other our experience, but it was very educational. We walked through this whole text about different types of mental illness, different types of medication, what kind of local resources were available. I highly recommend that, that you find your local NAMI and find out what resources are available to you in terms of both support groups and education. They're, they're really good at both things. And if you are ready to become an advocate, there's also uh, an avenue through NAMI for that. Fresh Hope for Mental Health has support groups. Some of them are online and some of them are in real life. Um, that is a great resource for Again, both people who are who have lived experience and who have a loved one with mental illness. Thank you for sharing those lifelines with the listeners. And I have to say, I know Dina Yo, she is a tremendous individual. So her support group is going to reflect the kindness and authenticity of her heart and her character. Yes, as well. she's she's just wonderful. She's yes, such a mentor. And I've had clients who found a lot of support from NAMI too. So that is also a really great resource. So those of you who are listening, there is another resource I want to make sure that we mention. Kirsten, you just released your book. So talk to us about how people can connect with you and your book so that they can see that specific perspective of a parent who has survived and is surviving that parenting crisis of having a child who's struggling with mental illness? Yes, I just released 
Among Lions. The subtitle is Fighting for Faith and Finding Your Rest While Parenting a Child with Mental Illness. The theme of the book is this idea that when your child has a mental illness, you are in a place that you cannot leave. This is your child. This is the circumstance you find yourself in you can't just walk away from that. So you have to stay there and you have to find your rest there. But at the same time, there are these beasts that can come and try to attack you. The beast of shock or resentment or disillusionment or disappointment. So these beasts are coming at you in a place that you cannot escape, but there is protection for your soul and there is rest for your soul right there in the middle of the beasts. That's what Among Lions is about. It has a lot of practical information. It has some of our narrative story. It has wonderful interviews with mental health professionals like you, Tina, are, are, were instrumental in sharing your expertise in the book. And I, I just want to say thank you so much for letting me interview you for that book. Really appreciated that. It lent so much richness to the material. And if people want to contact me, my website is kirstenp.com. If they want to find out about the book, they can go to amonglionsbook.com. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It's an honor to support your work and your ministry being courageous and offering this difficult material much needed by many people. So I really appreciate all of the effort you've put into this, all of the perseverance that this required. And I hope that all of you listening will connect with Kirsten and find out more, whether it's your child or whether you have children in your community, you may not even know about them yet, but make sure you have made yourself aware of what families can do to find rest when they're struggling in parenting crisis. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Tina. It was a pleasure to be here. And I hope that all of you listening will also come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment.